So the Bush, Reagan Bush administration and Congress decided that they were going to deregulate, quote unquote, savings and loans. And this allowed SNLs to basically invest their money and lend their money on anything they wanted to and was an open invitation to the criminal element. And sure enough, the mafia was one of the first people, uh, groups involved in looting SNLs in the early 80s. And the deregulation that Bush was in charge of did that. So we, in a sense, were financing these covert illegal operations. Uh, and it, it's the way that, of course, Oliver North and William Casey, it's the way that George Bush, the way they like to do things. Now, in Texas, we found a, a Louisiana mobster named Herman K. Beebe, yeah. who was controlling SNLs in a different way than Renda. And we found Beebe and Renda together in many, many different places across the country, and many connections between the two. This SNL that, that Benson bought after he got out of Jefferson, uh, became Continental Savings, and that purchase was financed by Herman K. Beebe. So it's possible that Mafia money went to Lloyd Benson. A subject that has been ignored by the establishment media. Pete Bruton has written a book about it, and we talk with him right now on Alternative Views. <laughs> Today, Alternative Views will interview Pete Bruton concerning his book, The Mafia, CIA, and George Bush. Pete is a former Houston Post reporter who broke the story of the connections between the SNL scandal and the CIA, exposing how CIA assets would borrow money from the SNLs to finance off-the-book operations and then declare bankruptcy and leave U.S. taxpayers with the bill. Well, for the past five years, Pete has been tracking down who actually profited from the SNL scam, who the main players were, and how they skimmed off their money. Lo and behold, Pete discovered that the beneficiaries of the SNL scandals were friends of George Bush and his family, unsavory folks connected to the CIA and mafia, as well as associates of Texas big shots such as Senator Lloyd Benson and Houston power broker Walter Mischer. Well, obviously, this is an explosive story, and today we are going to explore the full ramifications of the SNL crisis with author Pete Bruton, who's now a law student here at the University of Texas. Pete, this is such an incredible story, one that is so complex, it seems to me almost one impossible to tell, but you do it so well in your book. Uh, before we get into the intricacies of it, I wonder if you can tell us uh, how George Bush himself was involved in this. His family was, but was he himself involved much? Bush's role was on many levels. First of all, as vice president during the Reagan-Bush years, he was the head of the Reagan-Bush deregulation efforts across the board, and that included savings and loans. And the deregulation of savings and loans that occurred primarily in 1982 with the uh, St. Germain Garn bill um, basically opened up savings and loans to the crooks. Uh, SNLs had traditionally just done home mortgage lending uh, to middle class Americans and they succeeded very well for 50 years. Uh, they had some problems then in the late 70s and early 80s with the inflation, so the Bush, Reagan Bush administration and Congress decided that they were going to deregulate, quote unquote, savings and loans. And this allowed SNLs to basically invest their money and lend their money on anything they wanted to and was an open invitation to the criminal element. And sure enough, the mafia 
was one of the first people, uh, groups, involved in looting SNLs in the early 80s. And the deregulation that Bush was in charge of did that. Uh, Bush also, as vice president, either he or his top aides intervened in the federal regulation of the biggest failed savings loan in the country at that time, Sunrise Savings in Boynton Beach, Florida. The CEO of Sunrise went up to Bush's office when he was vice president, and the, the story varies. He tells one story one time and one story another. He either met with Bush, with Bush's top aides, including C. Boyden Gray, who is the current White House counsel. Uh, and he asked them to get the federal regulators off his back. They were trying to stop Sunrise from basically throwing their assets away. And uh, one week after he met with these people, uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board that regulates savings and loans withdrew a very stringent cease and desist order against Sunrise and replaced it with a weak supervisory agreement. And a congressional study found that this move cost taxpayers possibly $100 million or more in keeping Sunrise open. Sunrise was then closed down a year later, a year and a half later, uh, at a cost of the federal taxpayers of $700 million. And there was no Federal Home Loan Bank Board investigation. It was just shut down. Uh, we find if you look at the major borrowers at Sunrise, you find mafia people, you find CIA people, and you find a Houston businessman named John Riddle, who ties into the circle of Houston businessmen that George Bush comes from. And Riddle, at this time, was involved in the transshipment of arms to the Middle East. Now, the top number two official at the Federal Home Loan Bank Board and Fairbanks was in this meeting with the Sunrise CEO when he was asking them to get the Fed's office back. Her husband, Richard Fairbanks was in charge at that time of the State Department's efforts to keep arms from Iran called Operation Staunch. He quit a year later and became the Washington lawyer and lobbyist for Iraq and worked with Iraq until Iraq <laughs> invaded Kuwait. Now it's interesting also to note that the largest failed SNL in the country that did not have a Federal Home Loan Bank Board investigation, Sunrise was number two largest. The largest was Hill Financial in Red Hill, Pennsylvania that plays a big part in my book. And the number two borrower at Hill Financial was John Riddle's buddy, a Houston builder named Mike Atkinson, who at that time was transshipping arms to the Middle East. So you find a connecting thread here of arms to the Middle East and savings and loans. And, and Bush's office was directly involved in keeping the Sunrise, uh, Sunrise Savings open and was lending money to John Riddle. It seems like such a, a complex thing, but it seems everywhere you look, there are certain things going on. The CIA and the Mafia, and uh, there were drugs that were being run back uh, into the United States. There were illegal arms being uh, procured and sent to uh, the Contras, as well as to Iran. And Iraq, as we and, now know. And Iraq. Uh, but all of these interests coincided, the Mafia, the, uh, now, how did the mafia, was the mafia just after money? Is that how, and, uh, and uh, perhaps the selling of drugs when they came back into the United States? I think the mafia just found it as another, you know, trough they could feed at. And I think they were in on it at the beginning when they saw, they knew what deregulation was going to do. And the fact that they, they figured out a scheme, and, and the head of this scheme was a New York mobster named Mario Renda, mm -hmm. who went to jail for like, less than three years. Uh, he was convicted in New York, Florida, and Kansas City. Uh, Renda would collect money from various institutions like pension funds and credit unions, bundle it up into $100,000 bundles so it was covered by federal deposit insurance, and then place it in savings and loans all across the country, billions of dollars. And once he got the money, the deposits into an SNL, he could basically control them. He, could, he had a hammer over their head if they didn't do with this money what he wanted to, he'd just pull it out. And this was called linked financing. He would place the deposits and then tell the SNLs to loan the money, to lend the money to his buddies. They would then just rip it off, take it and, and, and rip it off. Now, in Texas, we found a, a Louisiana mobster named Herman K. Beebe, yeah. who was controlling SNLs in a different way than Renda. And we found Beebe and Renda together in many, many different places across the country.
many connections between the two. But BB would actually finance the purchase of savings and loans by his associates like Don Dixon at Vernon, Carol Kelly at Continental, Jarrett Woods at Western, Roy Daly at First Savings of East Texas. And then he would have a hammer over their head where he was holding the note on their stock to the SNL so they would do what he wanted to. I think it's so significant what you've pointed out that this isn't just something, the, these relationships aren't something which came together suddenly when they said, oh, hey, here's a great big uh, pig, let's cut it up. There were, this was just a continuation of relationships between powerful people uh, at various levels, uh, state, local, and national, that have been going on for some time. Well, that's, that's correct. In fact, we had a sort of dry run on the SNL scandal in the mid-70s in Texas with the so-called Texas Rent-A-Bank scandal, where we have the same people that showed up in the SNL crisis ripping off small Texas banks and doing the same thing, trading bad loans between each other, uh, trading co capital stock loans between each other. And uh, Herman K. Beebe was in the middle of that. Uh, ben Barnes, his, his uh, business partner, was in the middle of it. And then later, Ben Barnes and John Conley show up as big, big borrowers at many of the dirtiest SNLs in the country. Uh, George Alban, another uh, guy that was involved in savings and loans, uh, was in the Texas rent bank scandal. So, and, and the federal government knew about the rent bank scandal. They came in and, and did an investigation. Uh, there was a savings and loan in Texas and Houston called Surety that a woman named Rosemary Stewart was in charge of, of the federal regulation of in Washington. And she saw Herman KB, she saw Walter Misher, she saw Misher's son-in-law, Robert Corson. And when these people all got back in the SNLs, you know, five, ten years later, she did nothing. And she was then in charge of the Office of Enforcement of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. Pete, yeah, your book begins, in fact, by discussing Walter Misher, who is a Houston banker and power broker, as a major player in this whole SNL scam. Can you tell a little bit about him and what role he actually played in this scenario? Yeah, Walter Misher um, was at the very center of the Houston business connections that, that all, you, you take all these SNLs and you start tracking back where the money goes and you find Misher and his friends. Misher was what we call a hyphenated Texan, banker hyphenated <laughs> developer. And there's probably a few other hyphens in there too, uh, political power broker. Um, he controlled politicians on all levels. Um, Misher basically told the Houston developers who they were going to donate political campaign, uh, campaign money to. Um, Misher had the third largest bank in Houston, Allied Bank, and he used Allied Bank to finance many different things, including some of the dirtiest savings and loans in Houston, like Continental Savings, uh, Mainland Savings, uh, and some others. And in fact, Misher knew that the SNLs were going down the tubes in the early 80s because he sold a savings and loan he had, Ben Franklin Savings, that at one time had belonged to Lloyd Benson's company. Uh, he also ordered all the SNL capital stock loans out of, of Allied uh, in 82, 83, so that when these SNLs failed, he wouldn't be caught holding the bag. And in turn, he had many savings and loans helping he and his bank out indirectly. In one time, Mainland Savings in Houston bought a $20 million loan that Allied held on an oil company it was in bankruptcy. And a later investigation showed that Mainland lost at least $14 million on this. There was no hope of repaying, and Mainland just did it as a favor to Allied. The CEO of, of Mainland had had his Mainland stock financed at Allied Bank and was a good friend of Walter Misher. And, and what sort of political friends did Walter Misher have? Who were his main sort of political connections? Well, Misher goes back to the old 8F days of the Lamar Hotel in Houston where the Brown brothers, uh, Jesse Jones, Gus Wortham, these people were wheeling and dealing, controlling Houston and, and politicians like Lyndon Johnson. It goes back that far. And then you bring uh, uh, Misher, was very close to John Conley, Ben Barnes, uh, Lloyd Benson, and George Bush. And uh, most of the Houston mayors and Harris County judges um, almost all of the Texas governors 
except for Ann Richards. I'm not sure about her, but we know uh, Dolph Briscoe and, and uh, even uh, Republicans like Bill Clements, uh, Misher was very close to and supported. And Misher's political donations and influence went to both parties. It was not just Democrats. I mean, he, he supported Democrats, of course, back in the 50s and 60s when Democrats controlled the state. But he also, you know, controlled and, and helped a lot of, of Republicans like John Tower and, uh, and George Bush and Bill Clinton. So he was a well-connected uh, fellow. Very well connected, and, and not just, of course, the politicians. I mean, he was connected to the mafia, well, that's which was a big shock. I mean, when, when uh, I was reporting the Houston Post, and people started telling me about his connections to the mafia, and uh, we did a big interview with him, and it was on the cover of the Houston Post Sunny Magazine. And uh, I asked him, what about all the rumors about your connections to Carlos Marcello, the New Orleans mafia boss? And he admitted that he had sat down to do business with Marcello. At one time, Marcello had come in and wanted to buy a couple of his hotels, including the Carousel Hotel on the South Loop. And he said he did not sell them to him because he did not want to get, quote, run out of town. Well, it turns out <laughs> when you investigate who he really sold it to, it turns out to be a Marcello frontman and associate. So he really did, and, and Misher and his partners kept the deed, the title, to this hotel while Marcello's front man was showing the X-rated movies and running prostitutes in this hotel. And what about uh, H.K. Beebe, his connections with Walter Misher and the uh, mob? Yeah, well, well Beebe, the, New Orleans, uh, the Louisiana Mafia associate from Shreveport, um, had turned up first in the Texas rent bank scandal where he was connected to Ben Barnes, who of course was in Walter Misher's hip pocket. Um, Beebe then uh, was borrowing money from Misher's allied bank. Uh, Misher was supporting him, they were making him uh, operating loans, uh, giving him insurance business, and in one case, uh, uh, the stock of Continental Savings in Houston was financed at Misher's allied bank with a guarantee from Herman K. Beebe. So they were very close in doing business, not only in the Tex Houston area, but in Louisiana. We find associates of Misher, very close associates, including the former controller of the currency, Robert Clark, going in and buying a bank with Herman K. Beebe in Louisiana, along with two, the two top executives at Misher's bank. Now, was he, uh, was Beebe uh, under Marcello? Oh, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. And this had been determined actually by the Texas Attorney General's Organized Crime Strike Force in the mid-70s. Uh, John Hill has actually had an organized crime investigative unit uh, headed by, I believe, Tim James, and they found the connections between uh, Herman K. Beebe and Carlos Marcello. Uh, Beebe was also tied to Marcello by the New Orleans Metropolitan Crime Commission. This is back in the mid-70s, and then you find all of the connections then later with the SNL scandal. Can you give us an example of how the mafia comes in with the mob, uh, loots a savings alone or two, and then move on? Well, they would, uh, in Beebe's case, he would actually finance the, the controlling stock of an SNL, and then the loans would be made to either Beebe or his associates, and then they would take the money and walk the loans and uh, leaving the SNL with property that wasn't worth any what, or what they'd lent on it. And that's the way they'd basically fail. How did the CIA get involved then with these people? Well, that, that's a good question. I, I don't think we know the final answer yet. Um, there are some people that believe that William Casey had been in on the beginning of the deregulation and knew that it was susceptible. You know, Casey was an old Wall Street lawyer and head of the SEC at one time and knew that the, the SNLs were very vulnerable to being looted and the money taken out and, and never found. Uh, but on the other hand, we have people like Walter Misher uh, who are connected to the CIA can probably see that if they keep the CIA happy, you know, diverting some of the money to CIA operations, then you know, they will get what the FBI calls the CIA's get out of jail free card. In other words, if they're working, doing, and helping the CIA and they get caught, then the CIA can come in and say, don't prosecute this person, uh, he's working with us. And that happened on a number of occasions in the SNL crisis. 
where we would have a, a, a savings and loan looter or a bank looter getting caught by the FBI and the Justice Department, the CIA trying to get them off the hook because they work with them. Now, we've had on Alternative Views, those of you who've been watching Alternative Views regularly know that about the uh, drug scams which were going on where illegal arms would be shipped down to the Contras particularly and the C-130s would be filled up with uh, cocaine and all and brought back in the United States and offloaded, sometimes at U.S. Um, Air Force bases, sometimes at uh, uh, more covert landing strips. Uh, now. How would this operation fit in with what we're talking about? Right. Uh, we found a number of people in Florida that were helping the Contras, taking weapons, guns for drugs, that were involved in failed banks and savings and loans. Um, one CIA gun and drug runner was a guy named Jack DeVoe. And DeVoe was actually bringing in his cocaine into the Ocean Reef Club on Key Largo. It was owned by Carl Linder the Cincinnati uh, businessman. Oh, and he's very the, close to Bush. Very close to Bush. Okay, Bush would go down and actually vacation at the Ocean Reef Club. And there's a picture in my book of Bush in a fishing boat off Ocean Reef. And this is where Jack DeVoe was bringing in his cocaine. And DeVoe was also taking guns down to Latin America for the CIA. Now, DeVoe's money launderer was a Miami attorney named Lawrence Freeman. Freeman had previously worked for Paul Hellowell, one of the founding fathers of the CIA, and also was laundering money for Santo Traficante, the Tampa, Florida uh, mafia boss. Freeman drew up the documents, the sales contract for a 21,000-acre land deal in the Florida Panhandle that Hill Financial Savings, the one in Pennsylvania we previously talked about, and Vision Bank Savings in Kingsville, Texas, that was owned by Walter Mischer's former son-in-law, financed. And here we have Lawrence Freeman uh, drawing up the papers and involved with these people. And he's you know, closely connected to the CIA, had been the in-house counsel for Castle Bank and Trust in Nassau, uh, a bank that was used by the mafia and the CIA to hide and launder money and was shut down when Paul Hellowell died. And it appeared that many of these, these offshore money laundering operations were moved after Castle Bank failed and, and was shut down to the Isle of Jersey. And Lawrence Freeman was laundering Jack DeVoe's drug money through the Isle of Jersey. Uh, Robert Corson, uh, Mishra's former son-in-law, and Mike Atkinson were laundering SNL money through the Isle of Jersey, along with some people in Colorado that connect to Neil Bush. All were using the same, the same trust. The same trust on the Isle of Jersey were getting drug money and SNL money, and they were mixed in in the same bank accounts. Um, Pete, could you give us some examples of how the CIA would loot SNLs and what they'd use the money for? Well, it, it's not like the CIA would you'd, you'd get a loan from an SNL and, <laughs> and, and down the bottom line, you know, for guns, guns to uh, the Contras. Signed by the CIA. Right. right. Uh, that's not the way they operate. I mean, they use cutouts and front people so that to maintain their plausible deniability so that they can come in and deny that it wasn't them. And what's a cutout then? A cutout is a front man, a middle person, who may not even know he's working for the CIA. Mm -hmm. I mean, there could be four or five levels of, of cutouts and front men, the, the layers that the CIA, would, the money would flow through so that it couldn't be tracked back to the CIA. Um, one of the best examples we have in the SNLs was when mainland savings, this is the SNL that Walter Mischer was financing the stock of, this is the SNL whose, whose chairman of the board, Raymond Hill, was a close and longtime friend of James A. Baker III, White House Chief of Staff, former Treasury Secretary, former Secretary of State, George Bush's best friend. Uh, when Mainland failed, James Baker's old law firm, Andrews and Kurth, in Houston, was brought in by the feds to investigate the failure and file a lawsuit against the officers and directors to try to recover the lost money. Andrews and Kurth investigated actually drew up a lawsuit, a petition, but it was never filed. It was stopped at the top layers of Andrews Kurth and the federal government. And as a result, no lawsuit was ever filed against Raymond Hill, the, the, the mainland CEO, and no money was ever recovered. Uh, no indictments have ever been filed against anybody in the failure of mainland savings. Okay, so here we have this SNL. It's wired in to Walter Mischer and James Baker. Uh, in the summer of 1985, 
James Baker went before a Senate Finance Committee as Treasury Secretary and told them that there was nothing to worry about in the SNLs. Everything was wonderful and fine <laughs> and nothing bad was going to happen. At the very same time, Mainland Savings was entering into a $68 million land deal with Adnan Khashoggi, a oh. Saudi Arabian middleman yeah. and arms dealer. And uh, it was a very complicated deal. The result of it was that Khashoggi walked away with about $16 million in cash profit, pure profit from this land deal. Uh, the taxpayers later got stuck with about a $50 million loss on this deal. This was closed. This deal was closed and the money transferred on August the 1st, 1985. Six days later, Adnan Khashoggi begins the transfer of $5 million to Gobanifar, the Iranian middleman, to start the first publicized arms for hostages deal. It's interesting that he transferred $5 million to Gobanifar because at the same time, Mainland was basically giving him $16 million. They also gave him a $5 million letter of credit that was very strange because it could only be drawn on in the first week in November of 85. And it had all the earmarks of a guarantee. And in fact, later when Khashoggi's people were trying to cover this up from the FBI, who, who caught on to this pretty soon, uh, they said it was a, to guarantee uh, some stock that Khashoggi had bought from mainland. But the money to buy that stock had come from mainland in this deal. In other words, mainland gave Khashoggi $10 million he gives it back to them in exchange for $10 million in stock. And they said, oh, by the way, here's a letter of credit for $5 million to guarantee this stock. It didn't make any sense at all because it came from mainland. The money came from mainland, but the $5 million matches exactly the $5 million that Khashoggi paid Gabbana for. So, Pete, this is, in a sense, the beginning of Iran-Contra. Yes. It's funded with SNL money. So and one ultimately. of the reasons why Baker and Bush and the U.S. government was not regulating the SNLs, was not doing something about this crisis that was emerging, is because they were using the SNLs to finance some of their off-the-book activities they didn't want Congress or the public to look into. I think, Is that a correct? Point? I think that's ultimately what happened. Now, whether we can prove that they, quote, used them, uh, you know, we'll probably never know, but that is the ultimate upshot of what happened. And the money, of course, from mainland ultimately came from the American taxpayers. So we, were, in a sense, were financing these covert illegal operations. Uh, and, it, and it's the way that, of course, Oliver North and William Casey, it's the way that George Bush, the way they like to do things. I mean, North testified before Congress that what William Casey was looking for and trying to set up was a self-sustaining, off-the-shelf, self-financing covert operation. And here we had it. Uh, we see it in operation with the savings and loan money that ultimately came from the American taxpayers. So, you know, Khashoggi wasn't out any money. Uh, the Iranians and Israelis really weren't out. It came from the American taxpayers. Incredible. Now, in the, so much of what we've talked about previously in alternative views and in a lot of the news stories that you would read, they would mainly focus on the savings and loans themselves and all these wheelers and dealers like Don Dixon up in Vernon Savings or Charles Keating and all of that. But we're talking about a stratum above that those people aren't we oh definitely I think Dixon and Keating and, and all the others Ed McBurney and Jarrett Woods Tyrell Barker were just front men I mean they were cutouts basically and if you look at how much money they got I call them one or two percenters uh, Dixon got maybe what 20 million dollars out of Vernon I mean he himself and Vernon is costing taxpayers over one billion dollars Keating got about 40 million dollars and Lincoln Savings is costing taxpayers two billion dollars. So you can see you're getting one or two percent and, and it's a classic front man setup. And uh, the people that you have to, who's really getting this money and you start scratching and digging you find that you, you're in another stratum as you say of businessmen who are connected to the politicians very strongly. Of course Keating had strong connections too but if you look at who got the money out of, out of Lincoln you find uh, John Conley and Ben Barnes getting close to a hundred million dollars. Uh, you find a little bank in Paris called Saudi European. Paris, Texas. Paris, 
Uh, no, actually, Paris, France. Paris, France. Yes. Oh. It, it connects into the BCCI. Oh, I see. And uh, Keating was investing money in, in that. Um, and you start scratching and digging, you find even bigger players than Keating behind this.